Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, especially for having a shark up there, favorite animal. And, and also, by the way, thank you so much for having me follow Ellen Rabinovitz and David de Rothschild. <laughs> so, uh, I am going to have to talk very fast because Andrew said that he would buy me champagne if I finished my talk early. And you know, let me tell you something, you are going to be buying me champagne after this. Um, so the first question, I, I've been on the road for about five weeks now, my book tour, and the first question that people ask a lot of the times is why waves? You know, what is it about waves that, you know, why would you write a book about waves? And I guess the answer to that is, you know, outside of the sun, the waves that I'm writing about, which, you know, start at 60 feet, and in one case go up to 1,740 feet, are pretty much, you know, one of the most powerful forces of nature on the planet. And at the same time, they're really mysterious. And uh, I seem in my work to be drawn to things that are mysterious and in also beautiful and terrifying at the same time. And the ocean provides those kinds of stories, you know, with, you know, a, lo a lot of those kinds of stories. Um, but uh, the waves in particular have been making scientists scratch their heads um, in recent decades, and they still are. In, in, in the book, really, what I'm writing about are three different kinds of waves. The first kind um, are rogue waves, which you hear that word a lot, and uh, it's used rather loosely, um, but what it means to a scientist is wa are waves that are two, at least two times as big as the seas around them, sometimes even three and four times as big as the seas around them. And under certain circumstances, we know why rogue waves form. There's one thing that happens if you get a very fast, warm current, like, say, the Gulf Stream or the Agullas Current off the southeast coast of Africa, and then you get a big storm, like, a, say, a hurricane or something that has been barreling up from Antarctica, and they collide. So then you get these waves that are just very weird and misshapen, and sometimes um, the, the wave energy will focus, even like the way a magnifying glass can focus sunlight. But there are other uh, circumstances under which rogue waves form where a 100-foot wave could actually happen in 25- um, or 35-foot seas, and nobody really to this day knows why. Um, but the thing that for years and years had happened was that scientists, I mean, that uh, captains and it was more like it was lore, basically. It was nautical lore, and nobody really believed it because it didn't make any sense. It didn't obey the linear mechanics that, that we think govern the ocean, and, and yet at the same time you were hearing this, this thing carried over through the centuries, things like the three sisters or the hole in the ocean, and it was kind of clear those things were happening. I think the other problem with def de definitively proving the existence of rogue waves was that a lot of ships that would go out and encounter them were not heard from again. And, um, <laughs> You know, uh, what, what, what they found was that these rogue waves that are, you know, that they can't understand, it's one wave basically starts stealing, and I'm not a scientist, so I tend to love to sort of personify this, like one wave becomes like a clever oceanic criminal, and it steals all the waves, all the energy from its wave mates, and it can build itself up to be, to, you know, to be that, this sort of teetering monster that's actually in the process of breaking, even in places where you normally wouldn't expect it to break, and it can break on a ship. And, um, you know, and this is, just, this is just not what you want to see, you know, if you're <laughs> captaining a ship. And, and so one of the things that um, made me want to write a book about waves was that in 2005 I saw an article in the New York Times titled The Mystery of the Disappearing Tankers. So here's a tanker. As you can see, they're quite large. <laughs> and, you know, it's one thing for me to lose my wallet or, you know, maybe even my mind, but how do you lose a thousand-foot ship? Like, how do you lose it? What, if even if an airplane dropped off the radar with all its passengers on it, would we'd kind of notice and we would, might know where it was. Um, but what it said in this article and what really stopped me in my tracks was that uh, a scientist, a European scientist, said, "We're losing two large ships a week, and it just gets put down to bad weather." And I found this to be a really astonishing statistic, um, and wanted to find out more about how, what was actually happening. So I kind of went to the source, what I considered to be the source, Lloyd's of London. And Lloyd's of London uh, is a fascinating place. I actually could write an entire book on Lloyd's of London. This is the Lutine Bell, which they ring every time, they used to ring every time a ship was lost. Now they kind of ring it ceremonially, but uh, while I was there, it actually got rung. Um, so that was, that was the investigation for rogue waves led me to what I thought was kind of the source to find out how many ships were actually going missing. And the number that I felt comfortable writing in the book was more like two a month, but that's still a, a lot when you think about it. And it became very clear to me that it, when it comes to the ocean at its most extreme, we, we really don't know, actually, what's going on. 
Um, and, and yet the rogue wave stories kept coming, and, and from sources that, you know, Ernest Shackleton, not a hysteric, you know, not a whiner. And he, um, you know, he saw in 35 foot seas, he saw a 100 foot wave, and he was so traumatized by this. I mean, the poor guy at that point, he'd been through a bit. And, um, you know, his notion, and I love this quote, was uh, he called it a mighty upheaval of the ocean. Um, this is the Queen Elizabeth II. It was hit by a rogue wave in 1995 that blew out the bridge windows, which are at the top there, um, in Hurricane Ivan. So it was like in 42, 43 foot seas. But still, the captain who saw the wave said that it reminded him of the white cliffs of Dover when he saw it. Um, in 1995, finally, scientists got definitive proof that rogue waves existed. Uh, an oil rig called the Dropner oil rig in the North Sea was hit by an 84-foot wave on New Year's Day. It was 35 or 36-foot seas at the time. Um, there were lasers all over the platform, and so the wave came along, and it, not only was it measured by lasers, but it hit the platform at that level. So a lot of the times when they see a graph and it spikes, their piece of data spikes, they think it's an anomaly and they'll just take it off. Um, but in this case, it had actually done damage at that level, so there was really no denying it. And that's when scientists really had to sort of stand back and, and reckon with the fact that they did exist, and, and they were behaving in nonlinear ways that, that, you know, did not, that, that required a whole new set of equations. And, and now, the people who are looking at rogue waves tend to be uh, physicists, and especially theoretical physicists, because it seems that to really unravel this mystery of the ocean, we're going to need... Um, quantum theory, chaos theory, and, and things that have, we've been studying in light. Um, another wave that I uh, considered in the book and wanted to write about was, were tsunamis, which are, of course, giant, giant, giant waves. Um, they uh, are caused by lurching, different cause. They're caused by lurchings of the Earth's crust, um, an earthquake. For example, this is, this is an etching. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is um, Lisbon, 19, 1755. There was this, this earthquake, uh, about a 9.0 earthquake, and it really wreaked havoc on, raised Lisbon. It, and it basically, all of Western Europe, all of North Africa, it really lights out on that part of the world, and that really wasn't that long ago. Um, and when you think of uh, you know, the earthquake and the tsunami that we had in 2004, I felt personally, and I think a lot of people did, like, what? You know, a wave erased part of Indonesia? Uh, how? And so I was very intrigued by tsunamis. And as much as they don't seem to happen every week, the thing that they also don't do is never happen. They're a regular feature of the ocean. And um, we seem to kind of have this collective consciousness and this ability to forget things that happened, sort of cataclysmic things that happened not that long ago. So 1755 in geological time, not that long. Um, Another huge event, of course, was Krakatoa, the explosion of the volcano. And that was in 1883 and caused a, an even bigger tsunami in, in the area that it were around uh, Java and Sumatra. Can I get the first animation? This will give you a sense of really what happened in Krakatoa. So there's a tremendous amount of force. And, if that represents waves, like that's, you know, th that shoreline uh, was, there was, um, you know, obviously there weren't as many people as there were in 2004, but that was an, another absolutely tremendous um, cataclysm that happened. Uh, the west coast of the U.S., in fact, has a fault called the Cascadia Fault that, that has a lot in common with that fault in Sumatra that, that caused that tsunami. And in the past, as recently as 1700, that fault has created earthquakes in the 9.0 range that have caused waves that have hit both the west coast of the U.S. with the same kind of size and force and traveled elsewhere to Japan and Hawaii and done damage there. This is one of my favorite places that I wrote about. This is I, what I believe is the spookiest place on Earth. This is uh, Latoya Bay, Alaska, where the largest wave ever measured um, happened. And it was 1,740 feet. And, and the reason for that is because of the, geologically, it's as if nature set out to create the perfect factory for giant waves. That's the fair weather range in the background. A very big earthquake dropped huge amounts of uh, rock and ice into that bay. The bay is 700 feet deep. And it's really like dropping a giant paving stone into your bathtub. Um, and it, so what, what resulted was an epic splash, and they know exactly how high it was because it basically just scalped the entire 
surrounding uh, mountainsides of soil, of trees, of everything. And this was uh, July 9th, 1958. Um, there were some USGS geologists nearby, and one of them, Don Miller, took these pictures the next, uh, clo shortly thereafter. I don't know if these were the pictures he took the next day, but he was there the next day. And um, the, uh, the most amazing thing to me about this whole situation was that there were three boats in the bay when this happened. There were two that were kind of over um, on the side. Is this the laser pointer? I don't know. It, over to the side, there were two boats. And then there was one to the left of the island. And you see how narrow the entrance was. And the two boats, they were fishing boats that went in there for shelter. And um, so you hear this noise. It was 10 o'clock at night, still light in Alaska. Giant deafening noise. And that's about seven miles long. So if you can imagine the sight of that coming at you, um, two of the boats did the only thing they could do, which was they headed at the wave. Because here's a useful tip for you. If you ever encounter a giant wave, you have to go at it. You can't run away from it. Because you won't win that race. Um, you need to get over it before it crests. So they, these two mariners knew what to do. But what happened was they were then tossed back over the treetops into the Gulf of Alaska, but they survived. Oh, that's OK. Um, the, other boat was, um, the other boat was here, and it went for the exit and was never seen again. The other boats went like that. Um, can, we, can we show the uh, animation for Latoya Bay? This gives you a sense of, of how violent this must have been. Although this is kind of weird. Those mountains aren't that high on the left. But. So that's the, over, here, um, over here is like where it would have been 1,740 feet. There's the boats not having a good night. And all the trees and all the logs and everything were all sort of jammed in there and dead animals and just about everything you can imagine. But what's really cool about that instant is there's so many firsthand accounts of that night. Um, Another type of giant wave is uh, the giant storm wave. The way, and this is um, the, something that I wrote about a great deal in this book. I wanted to take readers into giant waves. And I, I knew that I would need a guide to, take, to help me to do that. And I, the, the best person that I could uh, think of to do that was Laird Hamilton. Um, and uh, so I spent, I spent a long time with Laird. So, you know, I, I met him five years ago, and I've, I've kind of been following him through that time and moved uh, to Hawaii to be near this wave, which is called Jaws. Um, one of the things in the book that, uh, that kind of delights me is that all the waves seem to have these different personalities. Um, and I think rather than showing a bunch of pictures, uh, what, what I'd like to do is play the first video, because uh, this is worth a thousand words for sure. I remember the first few times we were out there and yanked Laird onto this wave. And this one particular day was really, really big. And, and he's six feet, five inches. He's huge. And this wave made him look like an ant. And I was just shaking my head at what was right behind him, knowing that if he did wipe out or his equipment did falter, he would get eaten alive. And that's when that so-called Jaws, that image Jaws, came in. And I told him, you don't even want to know what was behind you. Jaws. It's the most perfect, top to bottom, barreling, deadliest right in the world. And not one other wave comes close.
So I wanted to know what kind of person does this for fun. And um, you know, Laird is often compared to Chuck Yeager, which I think all of these guys and uh, the toast surfers, this is uh, this type of surfing that they're doing, are really to surfers what astronauts are to pilots. And talk about breakthroughs, I mean, they invented the means by which to surf these giant waves because you couldn't really catch a wave bigger than 40 feet just by paddling. Uh, so they started creating equipment. It was really happened on Maui for this, in order to serve this particular wave. Um, and and I, I really wanted to go into these waves um, because I, I felt as though I really needed to, to be able to take readers and, you know, to, to into this realm that nobody's probably ever going to go into. And for me, it was the culmination of everything I d had done in my life. Along with writing, I also have a long decade, uh, several decades of competitive open water swimming, competitive swimming. So I felt as though it was kind of my opportunity to put all my loves together and layered. Uh, seemed sort of like uniquely prepared actually to, uh, to do that. Oops, sorry. Um, another uh, wave that I write about is a very weird wave called Chopu. Um, uh, hydrographers almost always refer to it as freakish. And um, there's a reason for that. I don't know if you can tell, but over to the left, it's, it's almost dry reef there. And um, people have died on this wave. There's an example of what, how it happens. It's very unusual. People get their faces torn off on this thing. And it's, it's really quite, an ex it's considered to be the heaviest wave in the world, even though it's not tall. But like to quote Laird, would you rather be attacked by a pit bull or a Great Dane? So this is the pit bull. Um, this is a kind of a wave that surfers are now starting to ride called a slab, which Chopu is a little bit like a slab, just a very misshapen, you know, what I call a sort of an oceanic car wreck of a wave, but they are riding them. Um, this is Garrett McNamara at Mavericks, another wave I went to. The book chronicles a very intense season in 2007, 2008. Um, and uh, the, this day, this particular day at Mavericks, two people died. And just down the coast at Ghost Trees, another surfer died. This guy's about to get his femur broken in five pieces in the next five seconds. Um, they, they went, I followed the surfers through the night. Uh, we went down to Mexico that night and ended up at a place called Killers off the coast of Ensenada, where I saw, I think, you know, uh, one of the bigger waves I've ever seen that, um, you know, was, was a, certainly a chilling experience and, and one that I'll never forget. This is the Cortez Bank, another giant wave off the coast of California that uh, 100 miles out, in fact. Um, Another person that I wanted to talk to for this book was Penny Holiday, and she had been in the waves in a way that the surfers had not. She's a scientist, and in 2000, Penny and her uh, research ship, the Discovery, were trapped in uh, about a week's worth of very bad storms off the coast of Scotland. They were, had been out there studying climate change, and um, you know, taking water samples was really what they were there to do. And talk about brilliant accidents. They they ended up measuring the largest waves ever recorded in the open ocean. I don't know how brilliant it was for the people on the boat. Uh, but the, it was very important information for everybody because the waves that they encountered were not forecast by any of the models. And these are the models that ships use, that recreational boaters use. And, and basically, these scientists that are trying to study all of the large systems that govern the ocean, govern the climate, rely on these models and put a lot of elbow grease into them. And it was very clear that from what the discovery went through, um, that's the boat at its home, that the models weren't accurate. And in fact, that we aren't aware, really, of all the variables, so we can't model for them. The ocean is far more complicated than that. And at the end of the day, my purpose in writing this book was to talk about what we don't know, I think, about the ocean. And it's a lot. I mean, in a time when we can split the atom and we can do all kinds of stuff, we still uh, are in kindergarten when it comes to understanding the, the thing that is most of our planet. Um, that was, uh, that's it in a very quick nutshell, but um, the wave uh, was my turbulent trip in this world, and uh, if you read it, I hope you enjoy the ride. Thank you. Thank you.